ecstasy. Instead of approaching inner unity, man recedes farther and farther from it. However the question of attaining unity is the most essential question of the inner development of man. Unless he attains inner unity, man can have no I, can have no will. The concept of will in relation to a man who has not attained inner unity is entirely artificial. Most of our actions are prompted by involuntary motives. The whole of life is composed of small things that we continually obey and serve. Our eye continually changes as in a kaleidoscope. Every external event that strikes us, every sudden aroused emotion, becomes color for an hour, begins to build and govern and is in its turn as unexpectedly deposed and replaced by something else. Inner consciousness, without attempting to disperse the illusory designs created by the shaking of the kaleidoscope, without understanding that in reality the power that acts and decides is not itself, endorses everything, and says about these moments of life in which different external forces are at work, this is I, this is me. From this point of view our will can be defined as the resultant of desires. Consequently, as long as desires have not become permanent the individual is the plaything of moods and external impressions. They never know what they will say or do next. Not only the next day, even the next moment is hidden from them by the wall of accident, happenstance, chance and circumstance. What happens to be the consecutiveness of one's actions finds its explanation in the poverty of motives and desires, or in the artificial discipline grafted by education, or above all in our imitation of one another. As to the person with so-called strong will, these are usually people of one dominating desire in the light of which all other desires vanish. If we fail to understand the absence of unity in the inner world of people, we do not understand the necessity of such a unity in Superman, just as we do not understand many of his other features. Thus Superman appears to us a dried-up being, rational and deprived of emotions, whereas in reality the emotionality of Superman, that is his ability to feel, must far exceed ordinary human emotionality. The psychology of Superman eludes us because we do not understand the fact that the normal psychic state of Superman constitutes what we call ecstasy in all possible meanings of this word. Ecstasy, jhana, is so far superior to all other experiences possible to man that we have neither words nor means for the description of it. Those who have experienced ecstasy have often attempted to communicate to others what they have experienced, and these descriptions, coming from different centuries, from people who have never heard of one another are wonderfully alike, and above all contain similar cognitional aspects of the unknown. Furthermore descriptions of real ecstasy contain a certain inner truth that cannot be mistaken, the absence of which is felt at once in cases of sham ecstasy, as it occurs in descriptions of the experiences of saints in formal religion. However speaking in general, a description in plain words of the experiences of ecstasy present almost insurmountable difficulties. Only art, that is poetry, music, painting or architecture, can succeed in transmitting, though in a very feeble way, the real content of ecstasy. All true art is in fact nothing but an attempt to transmit the sensation of ecstasy. Only one who finds in it this taste of ecstasy will truly understand and feel art. If we define ecstasy as the highest degree of emotional experience, which is probably a perfectly correct definition, then it will become clear to us that the development of man towards Superman cannot consist in the growth of intellect alone. Emotional life must also evolve, in certain not easily comprehensible forms. The chief change in humankind must come precisely from the evolution of their emotional life. If we now imagine someone approaching the new type, we must understand that they will live a certain peculiar life of their own that will be most unlike the lives of ordinary folk and difficult for us to conceive. There will be much suffering in their life, there will be sufferings which as yet affect us very little and there will be joys of which ordinary people have no idea and even a feeble reflection of which reaches us only very rarely. But for one who undergoes no change through contact with the idea of Superman there is in this idea a certain feature that imparts to it, a very gloomy aspect. This is the remoteness of the idea, the fact that Superman is very far away, cut off from us, from ordinary life. We occupy one place in life and he occupies quite a different place, having no relation to us except that in some way we create him. When people begin to realize their relation to Superman from this point of view, 
A certain vague doubt begins to creep in and gradually develops into a more definite and unpleasant feeling that is shaped into a negative view of the whole idea. People may reason and have often reasoned in this way. Let's grant then that Superman will come, and that he will be exactly as we have pictured him, a new and enlightened being, that he will be in a sense the result of the whole of our life. But what is it to us if it is he who will exist and not us? What are we in relation to him? Soil on which will grow a gorgeous flower? Clay, out of which will be modelled a beautiful statue? We are promised a light, that we shall never see. Why should we serve the light that will shine for others? We are beggars, we are in the dark, in the cold and are comforted by being shown the lights of a rich man's house. We are hungry and are told of the magnificent feast in which we can have no part. We spend our whole life in collecting pitiful crumbs of knowledge and then we are told that all our knowledge is illusion. That in the soul of Superman a light will spring forth in which he will see in a flash, all that we have so eagerly sought, aspired to and could never find. The misgivings that assail people when they encounter the idea of Superman have a sound basis and cannot be passed by. They cannot be disposed of by saying that man must find happiness in being conscious of his connection with the idea of Superman. These are nothing but words, man must. What if he does not feel happiness? Man has a right to know, has a right to ask questions. Why must he serve the idea of Superman, why must he submit to this idea? why must he do anything at all? In order to find the true meaning of the idea of Superman it is necessary to understand that the idea is much more difficult than is generally thought. This is so because the idea requires for its right expression and understanding of new words, new concepts and knowledge that may not be in the possession of ordinary man. All that is set forth here, all that portrays Superman, even if it introduces something new into the understanding of the idea, is far from being sufficient. Ideas such as the idea of Superman cannot be considered on the level of ordinary ideas relating to things and phenomena of the three-dimensional world. The idea of Superman recedes into infinity and like all ideas that recede into infinity, it requires a very particular approach, that is from the direction of infinity. In the ancient mysteries there existed a consecutive and graduated order of initiation. In order to be raised to the next degree, to ascend to the next step, the adept to be initiated had to pass through a definite course of preparation. They were then subjected to the required tests and only after they had passed through all the trials and had proved that their preparation had been serious, along the right lines, were the next doors opened before them and they penetrated more deeply into the temple of initiation. One of the first things that one to be initiated learned and had to appreciate was the impossibility of following a path of their own choice the dangers that awaited them if they did not carry out all the preparatory rituals and ceremonies required before initiation. If they failed to learn all that was required to be known, if they failed to remember all that they had to remember, they were told of the awful consequences following a violation of the order of initiation, the terrible punishments that awaited those to be initiated who dared to enter the sanctuary without having observed all these rules. What was required of them was the realization of the necessity of advancing by steps. They had to realize that it was impossible for them to outdistance themselves and that any attempt in this direction was sure to end tragically. A rigorous consecutiveness of inner development was the fundamental rule of the mysteries. If we try to analyze psychologically the idea of initiation, we understand that initiation was an introduction into a circle of new ideas. Each further degree of initiation represented the disclosing of a new idea, a new point of view, and a new angle of vision. In the mysteries new ideas were not disclosed to an adept until they had proven themselves sufficiently prepared to receive them. In this order of initiation into new ideas a deep understanding of the properties of the world of ideas can be seen. The ancients understood that the reception of each new idea required special preparation. They understood that an idea caught in passing could easily be seen in the wrong light or received in the wrong way and that a wrongly received idea could produce very undesirable and even lead to some very disastrous outcomes. The mysteries and their gradual initiation were to protect people from a half-knowledge, which is often much worse than no knowledge at all, particularly in questions of the eternal, with which the mysteries had to deal. The same system of gradual preparation of people for the reception of new ideas is brought forward to the rituals of magic. 
The literature on magic and occultism was for a long time entirely ignored by Western scientific and philosophical thought, or rejected as an absurdity and superstition. It is only quite recently that people are beginning to understand that all these teachings must be taken in a symbolic way, as a subtle and complex picture of psychological and cosmic relations. A strict and unswerving observance of various small rules, which often look trivial, incomprehensible and unrelated to anything important is demanded by all the rituals of ceremonial magic. Again, the horrors are described that await one who has broken the order of the ceremonies, or changed it of their own volition, omitted something by neglect. There are many legends of magicians who invoked a spirit but lack the power to control it. This happened either because the magician forgot the words of the invocation or in some way broke the magic ritual, because they invoked a spirit stronger than themselves, stronger than all their invocations and magical figures. All these instances of those who break the ritual of initiation in the mysteries, of the magicians who invoke spirits stronger than themselves, equally represent in allegorical form the position of one in relation to new ideas that are too strong for them and which they cannot handle because they have not undergone the required preparation. The same idea was expressed in the legends and tales of the sacred fire, which consumed the uninitiated who incautiously approached it and in the myths of gods or goddesses, the sight of whom was not permitted to mortals, who perished if they looked upon divine beings. The light of certain ideas is too strong for our eyes, particularly when we see it for the first time. Moses could not look at the burning bush, on Mount Sinai he could not look upon the face of God. All these allegories express one and the same thought, that of the terrible power and the danger of new ideas that appear unexpectedly. The Sphinx with its riddle expressed the same idea, it devoured those who approached it and could not solve the riddle. The allegory of the Sphinx means that there are questions of a certain order that man must not approach unless he knows how to answer. Then having once come into contact with certain ideas, man is unable to live as he lived before. He must either go farther or perish under a burden that is too heavy for him.